Uh, welcome to my talk. I will be talking about uh, PostJS and PG routing. These are two extensions for uh, spatial data in Postgres. First, um, who's your presenter? It's me, Marion. Um, I'm a full stack GIST developer uh, in uh, geospatial infrastructure. And um, since about three to four years, I've been doing a lot of um, work with data as well. So data loading, data extraction, and data preparation for uh, cloud usage and cloud applications. Um, this is the, my sponsor, the company I work for. We're based in Switzerland, France, and Germany. And um, we're enthusiastic about open source. Everything we do is with open source, and we try to also give back what we do. So what uh, is the agenda? Um, basically, I'm going to give a short introduction into PostGIS. Um, how are data, how is data saved? A very, very short overview of indexing and then more into the functions of how queries can be done with uh, PostGIS. Uh, the second part of my talk is uh, PG routing. Um, I'm going to explain a bit about the principles, how it works, and then give some uh, examples that we encountered that we work with. So to start off, PostGIS. The data part. Well, usually we start off with a database and we want to put data into that database. We have different tables and we'll assume it's a, um, a Postgres database. In my case, I usually like to store data that looks like this if we visualize it. So I have uh, points, I have lines, I have polygons. There's no polygons here, but um, we often encounter a lot of polygons. To make it more difficult, we often like to aggregate complex geospatially related data. And there we have some issues if we are using just Postgres. Um, this is an example where um, we had a lot of points that represent um, sales points. And what we actually wanted is uh, over different regions find out how is the, the sales doing. So not the specific points, but on a certain region to kind of know, do I need to invest more in that region or is it no use at all? So we use a lot of PostGIS. Post, uh, post That's the extension that, that saves our lives if we have these kind of geospatially related data. Um, what is nice is now we have the database as before, and we have the data as we had it before, and we can also have geometries in that database. Um, PostGIS, basically, it can be considered a spatial database or a, as as, uh, it can be used as a spatial database. It consists of, um, it, it, it's kind of like uh, uh, the, if you add it as an extension in your Postgres um, database, what you get is um, data types that are specific for uh, um, spatially related data. So we have geometries. Um, there's also a possibility for rasters. I have not used that very much because they tend to get very big in the database. Um, there's a special indexing system to, to uh, fasten up your queries. 
that's really um, specific for the, the spatial uh, data. And there is a whole set of function that's added to your data, to your Postgres database with the extension. So what data types are there? Well, there's points. I tried to, to find some picture where I have all of the data types. So the, I don't know if you see, yeah. Um, there's points that can be added. There's uh, the polygons the, that are possible to, to save. And um, it's very small, but there's also a line. <laughs> so you can um, save data in, in, uh, in, as a line. Um, further, it's also possible to have collections. So sometimes you have a country, and the country, the, the, the polygon of the country, it maybe is not one polygon, but it has an island, or it has a part that's... that's um, enclosed in another country. So for that, um, you have um, geometry collections. Um, it exists for points, so you can collect multiple points in one geometry, you can collect multiple lines in one geometry, and um, polygons as well. Um, as I said, I will keep the indexing part short. It's, it it's actually a topic on its own, but just basically um, indexing is it's quite important. Um, I think I have not added a um, geometric um, row in a in a database where I did not add an index as well. Um, it really really speeds up the, the the queries, and I think those who were in the talk at the beginning of the conference. Um, there was a talk about PostGIS, and there was really they were really showing the difference with and without indexing. Um, indexing is basically made with the help of bounding boxes. So, um, as a more visual example, if I have this kind of geometry, um, an index would kind of add a, a bounding box to 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 the geometry. And if I have something like this, with indexing, this would look like this, and it makes it much, much easier to compare this and see if two geometries intersect or they don't, if you only have to compare the bounding box and then go in into more details than if you actually have to compare the whole geometry with the whole complexity of the geometry. And then there's spatial objects. Once they, they are um, added, the, uh, the, the, the work with the bounding box is done, then they are added in a, in a tree so that the walk through can be done quickly. Um, I'm getting back to my example from the beginning. Um, this part is more about the, the functions. There's really a big library of functions that uh, PostGIS offers. I'm just going to go through uh, some that I encounter very often or that I work with, trying to also show uh, some examples so you have kind of a visual idea of use cases that they can be used. So here, what we did, as I said, these were um, sales points on a map. And what we did to, to get um, them into a uh, administrative regions. We use the SD contains or the ST within. It kind of goes, does a very similar thing, but if you have a SD contains, it just checks if the geometry A is within the geometry B. And um, using ST within, it checks if geometry B is within the geometry A. Um, this worked quite well for this example, but it was not perfect. The problem was that some of the geometries were not very specific, and we had points that 
were not allocated to a, to a region. So what we did to correct that was to check um, the distance of one point from the actual geometry. And if it was within a certain distance, um, we could correct it automatically and set the, the, um, the, the administrative region. It's not 100% foolproof, but for the use case, it was, um, it was okay. So here we have an example of a point that was outside of a region and that had no region at all that was, was intersecting. Um, and we just used the um, SD, uh, I think it was the STD within. So it just takes one geometry and looks if the second geometry is within that distance. And then we could kind of like allocate the, the um, an administrative region for that specific point and correct it in the, in the data itself or include it into the, the aggregation for the, for the data after. Um, another use case that I encounter quite often, um, I work also on the, on the application side. So once the data is in the database, usually um, my work continues. And uh, often we encounter issues that some of the um, geometries that we put into the database, they are really, really complex, meaning there's a lot and lot like for a, uh, a polygon, it, it takes up a lot of points. It's made out of many, many points. Um, for to, to correct that, um, there is a function, it's called ST Simplify. And what it basically does is for lines and polygons, as well as multi-polygons and multi-lines, it tries to simplify with a certain algorithm the, the complexity of the whole geometry and reduces the number of points that it's made out of. Um, I prepared a short demonstration of how this image came to be. Um, I'll try to show you what I did. So uh, is it big enough? Okay. So I prepared a table where I loaded uh, some polygons that are quite um, uh, big, or that were bigger than what was uh, the restriction of the application. So that's the table. Um, I added some, here I added the data, I created some index, and then I created a view. And in the view, you can see here, I did a different simplification. So, the ST simplify, it takes the geometry and it takes a parameter which tells it how much to simplify, basically. So I did the simplification with 0.1. Um, simplifying with zero basically does nothing because it doesn't simplify in the end. And the bigger the number, the more it simplifies. Um, then I did the simplification with a parameter of 10 and a parameter of 50. Um, here, uh, that's the query, that's actually this query. I can execute it. And what you see is the amount of points that are within one uh, polygon. So um, the first one is the not simplified. The second one is the one uh, with, um, I think it's with 10 and then with 0.1 and with 10. And um, basically what you can see, it just reduces really the number of points that are used to represent the, the geometry. Um, if we look at this in a more visual way, so this is the original geometry that you can see here in uh, brown. And I can add the layer with the 0.1. And what we see here, um, is that on a visual effect, it 
does not really change much. I don't see any change. It's still for like, it's still basically the same uh, geometry. Um, adding this layer, I can already see that some of the lines, they get cut off. Like here, I see that the, the green one is actually the, the simplification with 0.1. And now if I put the, the simplification with 10 over it, there's really already cutoffs. Um, and I simplify even more. There's really uh, a lot of um, cutoff. So if I'm really zoomed in on a, on a close level, it's possible to see the difference. But now if I zoom out, let me see if I can do this. Yes, I can still see the... Now it's hard to see the difference. So often what we do is to keep the original um, data and the level of simplification. So we can, depending on how much we are zoomed in, we can either show the, the, the simplified one or the not simplified one. Because if you're zoomed in also on a very close level, it, it, the, the geometry that needs to be rendered is much smaller because it's only a part that you see. So much for simplification. <laughs> um, so next, uh, PG routing. Um, what is PG routing? Um, basically, what is the idea that um, behind it is that you want to find a shortest path with a minimal cost between two points on a graph. So you have nodes, vertices, uh, graph orientation and cost. The cost is what, how much you pay for going from one node to the next. Um, to do this, um, a very useful extension is the PG routing and it brings the, the advantage that it's the, the whole routing process can be done within the, the Postgres database. Plus, you can make use of uh, Postgres because routing it's often um, a question of geographical uh, spatial data. Not always, but very, very often. Um, so the first thing to do when we want to use PG routing is we have to translate the graph into a table so that uh, it can be saved in the, in the database. Um, basically, uh, what is done is we have an ID. Um, there's a source, the source is where we start and the target is where we go. Uh, the cost from going from that source to the target and then the reverse course, the reverse cost, which is um, going from the target to the source, the, what is um, the cost. Um, if we put a minus one, means it's a path that we cannot take. So for example, going from E to D, uh, no, going from D to E is not an allowed um, path. Um, this is how uh, it would look in real life. So that's a very, very simple, simplified uh, example just to kind of get an overview. But um, that's what uh, we have in an actual database that would look. That's a, an extraction from data from the here map. And um, as you can see, we also have actually path. It's maybe like a one-way uh, street here that we cannot go. Um, what does the PG routing extension bring us? Basically, it brings 
a big set of different functions that we can call using um, SQL. Um, like uh, some examples are the, the Dijkstra algorithm or the A star algorithm um, that are used to find the shortest path. Um, the function structure, it's kind of universal for PG routing. Um, you have the PGR prefix with an underscore and then the name of the function. Um, then you have the, the inner query and um, depending on what, um, which, which uh, function you use, you have parameters and optional parameters. Uh, at the very bottom here, I have an example of the, uh, it's the, the turn restricted shortest path function. Um, so this is how the, the structure of, of calling the function would look like. Um, so, in more details, uh, I have a short kind of a, a hypothetic example here, and I will show other examples that are more uh, related to um, daily work. Um, basically, what I have is my graph, and I want to go from node 7 to node 12. And um, so, I give it the source and the target, um, the, this, is, this part is really the, the, the query that is done. And what it gives me, basically, is uh, this table. Um, it's, uh, how to read this is uh, you have the, the sequence that goes from one to five. These are just the steps that are taken. Um, the node where it starts and the edge that, that it takes and what the, the cost is for this edge. So here it goes from uh, seven taking the, the, the this path to, to uh, node eight and it's at the cost of two. Um, and then it continues to five at a cost of one and here it actually has a choice to between three paths, so it takes the, the, the well, not the cheapest, but in, in overall, it, it needs to be cheapest. Um, and then when it gets to not 12, it's done, and it sets minus one for the edge because it's, it's arrived where, where you set the, the target. And the cost is zero. Um, so I'm going to show a couple of live examples where we implement PG routing. Um, basically, they all use the here maps. Um, they use they are uh, from a project that we did in France, and um, what was the outcome of the, the when the whole data was Im uh, imported into Postgres was about uh, 11 million row, uh, rows of data. In, in um, so the whole graph is an uh, 11 million row um, table. Um, for each segment of the rows, there were different costs with a, vari uh, a variety of parameters. So depending on the on on distance and time, it's also depending on uh, with what you want to travel. So you have uh, if you have a car or you have a big big truck. It, depends like what row, what restrictions you have and what um, um, what cost is is after I, I put in the in the row. Um, also the what was one um, uh, main topic was that um, whether the situation was a normal situation or if it is an emergency situation. So in an emergency situation, you have other, um, or you can kind of trespass some of the restrictions that maybe otherwise you really should not. <laughs> um, 
The performance requirements for in, in this case was that the queries ran on the one second, and for really long routes, um, it had to run under five seconds, and this was actually um, possible to keep this um, constraint. Um, this is how the network looked that was loaded into the database. And if we zoom in, it looks a bit more like something that actually makes sense, maybe. Um, so it was a really big network. Um, the first example was um, if we have a, a, an emergency here, and there is a, a firefighter here. The, the question was um, how fast or what is the, the, the fastest route to get to the emergency place. Um, there's uh, two algorithms that were used, and there was the turn-restricted um, shortest path uh, algorithm, because that was for a more normal situation where there were actually restrictions on turns that, you, that had to be considered. And then um, the Dijkstra algorithm were, um, was used for emergency uh, situations where the turn restriction was no longer considered. So it was really a, um, a way to find a fast route. Another example that was done was um, if you start at A and you want to get to E, but in the meantime you have a couple of points that you want to visit in between. So there's a point B, there's point C, D um, that need to be visited and uh, you want the, the fastest route to travel through those um, um, through that, th those points. So um, there's a, a, an actual function that uses the traveling sa salesman or that, that has a solution to the traveling salesman problem. Um, and it's called that in short TSP. And uh, this question was actually solved using uh, uh, that uh, um, function in PG routing. What is also possible is to use isochrones or iso distance um, um, functions. Um, basically, what was the question was to estimate the like if you have a, a crime and the bank was robbed, the the police they might want to know how far do the robbers get in a certain amount of time. Um, for that, um, the post jazz was used as well as PG routing. <laughs> so the, the in in PG routing, first the driving distance was determined. So you had the start point, and then um, you set a, a distance how far um, this could be how far they could go, and you calculate what what is returned. Um, and then in PostJS, uh, the function, a function was used to, to get all of the points and put them in a polygon. So what was returned from uh, PG routing uh, was used after with a PostJS function to get, uh, um, to aggregate them in one polygon. Um, this looks kind of like this. So the driving distance um, function is, is used with, uh, you give it all the edges um, in, a, in a query statement, and this and the, the starting point and the maximum distance of the end 
point and it returns all of the, the points that can be reached within that distance. And what it returns is a set of um, a, a sequence, a node, an edge, and a cost table similar to what we saw before. Um, and in, in the next step, the, the table that was returned um, was taken, so all of the points were taken and they were put into the, the convex hull. Uh, it's just the name of the function that does kind of all of the, uh, that after that creates the uh, polygon like this. So if you have all of the points here, it would create a new geometry out of this. Um, and what came out was uh, graphs like this, if they are visualized on a nice uh, map. So what we have here is the, the, um, the robbery of the bank. And then within a, a maximum of 10 minutes, we see how far they can get and the, the, the dark blue lines, they are just two minute steps each. So in two minutes, they would get here. In uh, four minutes, it's possible to reach this part and so on. Um, I've actually seen this being done also with um, train journeys. So maybe starting at uh, Paris, it's interesting how far can you get with a train if within uh, a certain amount of time, let's say like four or six hours. And you can, you can expand that. Maybe you can use planes or whatever. Also, it's an interesting question for uh, uh, in emergency cases to know for the emergency people how far can they get or when is it better to have another station uh, get to a place in, in a general speaking mode. So PG routing, it's what does it answer? What kind of questions? Well, uh, a lot. <laughs> um, in basically, as a summary, it can be used to find answers to uh, questions of what is the shortest or the fastest path between two points, A and B. Um, if you start at A and you want to end at a multiple different points, it can give answers to that. Uh, if you start at different points and you want to get to one, point, um, that's also possible to, to, answer question, uh, to answer that question. Or also even if you have like multiple starting points and you have multiple end points, you can, uh, you can use PG routing. Um, and uh, one important or very interesting question that is also answered is the, the traveling salesman problem that we saw before with the different, um, uh, sorry, this one, that you can visit different places while traveling from A to B. And it gives you the shortest path. Um, advantages, um, you have the access to the full functionality of the whole Postgres that's, that, that, that's uh, there for the basics, as well as you can combine it with Postgres. Um, as we saw before, the routing questions, they are very, very often also um, geographical questions. Um, it's uh, very flexible with uh, with queries, with SQL queries. Um, there's very, very many different routing algorithms. So you can choose from a variety and you can adapt them to your needs 
um, well, if, if you have if you have one question, it might not be the proper uh, algorithm to use an A star algorithm. Maybe the Dijkstra is better. Um, and what is also there is a lot of tools to analyze what comes out of uh, PG routing, so you can really graphically analyze it. There is, for example, uh, QGIS, or there's um, there's a lot of others as well that you can use to after visualize what has been done, because often that helps more than seeing the data on a graph that's just numbers. Um, the cost parameter, it can be adapted dynamically. So as we saw before, we had the, the, the issue that um, the, we wanted to know what, what's the shortest path between A and B if I have like one big firefighter truck or if I just have like a really small police car or even a motorcycle. So the, that changes the cost and it can be adapted as well. Um, PG routing, it's powerful together with PostGIS as well as, as a standalone, um, but it's a very nice and convenient um, thing to have them really in one place with your data. You don't have to extract them and do the, the whole routing uh, in another application. It can be done within the database. Um, they are both open source under the uh, public license, and they have a really long uh, history as well. I think uh, it's up to 15 to 20 years that they already exist, so it's uh, uh, quite a solid um, uh, uh, extension, both of them. And um, the, there is a community that, that actively uh, develops within the... the uh, projects. And one very, very nice point is that uh, while I started to work with it, uh, the documentation, it's, it's actually very nice. It's understandable and it's, it's really helpful. It, um, it's well documented, both of the projects. I can recommend the documentation. <laughs> So um, that's the end of my talk. Uh, if I'm open for questions, if uh, there are any, feel free to ask. Thank you so much. Other questions? Yes, uh, thanks for the presentation. I just came from from another presentation that warned against uh, long-running transactions in general. And then you mentioned uh, the traveling salesman problem, and I foresee all sorts of situations with uh, very long-running transactions. Is it possible with PD routing to set a bound on how long the individual queries run so that they don't cause trouble? Um, I haven't seen that yet, I think it's not possible, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. But, yeah. Uh, it can be set uh, generally for, for user running queries or for ser server instance. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, about the routing things, uh, they had as a first argument the query. Is it, uh, is it already limiting uh, and it's just used to get the dot points out? Does it somehow use the query multiple times? Do you know about the internals there, the routing functions? So, for example, if you have a map and you have 11 million points, then would you give the query that returns the 11 million points and then it goes there, or do you restrict yourself already the points? Um, you can restrict the points. Um, basically, if we look at... Let me go back to uh, this. What you do is you... you here you add a select statement, and um, 
you, you do really uh, select from a table where you can also add a where clause and you can restrict the amount of points that you want in that are considered for the, the routing. Um, so you can basically um, it's what is hard in, in this part is to debug this query. So if it's a really, really slow query, this might um, hurt. Um, but if it's a, a normal query, this is actually a very good uh, way of restricting how many points that are uh, taken into consideration. And this is really the, the source of what is the done or what is used for the routing algorithm after. No, it really looks at, at this. Yes. Yes. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering if uh, topology is handled. I mean, when you have polygons and you just define a topology of points, so that defines polygons, for example, is that handled in PostGIS? And do you use that? Um, so you mean if you just have like points without uh, yeah like in open street map when they define areas it's just only points yes and a way of connecting points one to each other like a topology definition in is it uh, is it under this way in pages uh, yeah well basically uh, open street map is not that easy because they have quite a complex way of defining their um, their their geometries. But there's actually connectors, so you can export the open uh, street map data and import it into into uh, postures. Um, yeah, I was um, talking, for example, if you have in the simplification example you gave. Uh, further up, I guess. Yes. If you have two polygons that are touching, that share an edge, and you simplify, can you simplify both polygons at the same time? It just simplify the edge, and both polygons get simplified. Yes. Well, if they are, usually they are in, in different rows, so they're individual polygons. OK, so. So th it, each one would be simplified. Okay. on its own. So there may be gaps between them after simplification? Yes. OK. Other questions? Hello, great talk. Uh, please, uh, do you use OpenStreetMap data also? You were talking about uh, uh, here data. So if you have some examples also with OpenStreetMap data streets. Yes, we, we actually use it a lot. Uh, actually, the, um, the example I gave from the here map, we started off with the open street map. And I think in the end, it was a, a requirement or something that they, they ended up using the here map. But um, I think open street map is really great. And also, uh, in this example here, we actually used OpenStreetMap to extract all of the, the different um, um, administrative regions. So it, it was a bit of work to kind of get everything the way we need it, because there's a lot of tags, and you have to kind of figure out what you need, really, to extract. But it, it, um, it was uh, really nice to use OpenStreetMap, I thought. OK, thank you. Hi. Uh, as a Frenchman, I was very interested by getting uh, the data of uh, the entirety of France and was surprised that it was only 11 million lines. And maybe this question has been already partially answered, but can you elaborate on how you, the, the process of extracting the data, so from OpenStreetMap, if I got it, and uh, loading it into Postgres? Um, so it, there's two different uh, things. The, the data that, we extra that was extracted for the, the 
the whole of France um, that was based on here maps. And I'm not sure if they actually did some, um, uh, some restrictions because I did not really do the data extraction. It was uh, uh, my work colleagues who did that part. Um, so I cannot tell you if it's really all of France or if they, they left out some uh, parts that were not needed for some reason. Um, for the second question about the OpenStreetMap data extraction, um, there's, uh, there's actually engines that you can use. There's, uh, um, but the whole database, it's quite large. Uh, you can extract the whole world. Um, I think it's about, uh, yeah, I don't remember it, but it's in the terabyte, in about 100 or 80 terabytes, I think, if you have, take the whole world with all the streets and, and all of the data that it offers. But there's also a possibility to get data packages from uh, different countries um, that are smaller. Some of them are um, just the country entirely, or you get different regions of countries. And then you get, I think it's, uh, there's different um, types that you can extract. I think you can extract shapefiles and geodatabase, and then you can just import it. And as far as I know, there is also engines that you can export it directly into Postgres. That's the PGOSM or PG2OSM engine. I have not used that uh, personally, but I've used uh, like the, the a lot. The, there's the query engine for OSM, so I use that to kind of just extract a, a part and have a look at it. Thank you. I have time for one more question. All right, Marion, thank you so much for your time and enjoy lunch. Please don't forget to do uh, reviews and for the conference and for the uh, talks. Well, thank you.